All right, if you have your Bible tonight, I hope you have, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number 2 with me, please. Revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling, the opening up into the future. John, write the things which have you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be. The book of Revelation, more than one time, mentions the three aspects of time, past, present, and future, therefore covering all that encompasses time. Here in the second chapter of the book of Revelation, you will find our Lord Jesus Christ as he speaks, and here's what he says. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake, hast labored, and hast not fainted. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first, what? Father, bless this book. Give me unction to preach it. Lord, you, I pray that you use this time we have together for the glory of God. Lord, it's precious. Time is precious. It's not, it's not to be fretted away and wasted. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, there are seven churches addressed here. I was privileged one time to go with Brother Bob Bevington to the Holy Land. These churches, most of them are in what's modern-day Turkey. And you'll find that uh, if you go visit the places, you'll find that many of these places, there are no churches per se. There is one in Smyrna, and that's where Polycarp was the pastor, and he was a martyr of our Lord Jesus Christ. They burned him at the stake. They could not consume his body. And so, therefore, they, they, they understood that they were dealing with a saint of God, a man of God. Polycarp was. He lived 80-something years, freely gave his life for his faith in Christ. There's a church there. But when you come to Ephesus, you'll find that uh, there's no church. And if you'll notice carefully in Revelation chapter number 1, in verse number 18, let's set it in context so we'll understand what this means. Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Three aspects of time, past, present, and future. And he says, amen, which is a Hebrew word now, folks. You'll find that in Greek, but the Hebrew word amen means so let it be. It's akin to selah. Think on this, and may God bless him, so let it be. And have the keys of hell and of death. You ever wonder why it needs keys? Why is it locked? Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, now watch carefully, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now there's a lot of controversy as to what he means by the seven stars. To understand the seven candlesticks representing a church which is the light of the world, it's not too hard to understand that whatsoever. That's what we're here for. The light of the world is not the government. The light of the world is not the educational system. The light of the world is not uh, any secular organization. They, although, though the scripts Howard for years on their newspapers, they said uh, they showed a lighthouse, I think it was, back in the 60s, the Knoxville News Sentinel and the Journal, I forget which one it was. But it had a lighthouse, and it says, give the people light, and they shall find their way. The implication, of course, is that that newspaper is the source of light. Uh, how many of you would believe a newspaper today to be the source of your light? Um, right, exactly, and that's the response you'd get. No, uh, but back then, back in the 60s and the 70s, uh, I grew up, of course, here in this town, and they had two daily newspapers, one in the morning, one in the evening, one in the afternoon. And uh, the idea was that if you read this newspaper, you're going to be informed and you're going to have the light, you're going to get the light, and it's going to direct you as to how you should live your life. Well, I'm going to tell you this. The only source of true light is the Lord Jesus Christ because he said, I'm the light of the world. So the candlestick is no problem. The church of God is the source of light. It's the stars in the hand of this one in Revelation chapter number one. The controversy is, uh, who is this star? What does the stars represent? 
uh, if you'll notice carefully, Acts chapter number 20, at Ephesus, when the Lord, uh, speaking through his apostles, said, After my departure, grievous wolves shall enter in, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw the disciples after themselves. And he warns them, be prepared, take the oversight, lead my people, guide them into truth. And so therefore the bishop and the elder is responsible for the spiritual life of a church, of an assembly of believers, and ultimately lying in the hands of the bishop because he's the pastor of the church. And it's a very important thing to understand, therefore, that that bishop is accountable. I'm accountable for Temple Baptist Church, and I know that. I have to give an account to God. I do. Now, each of you give an account for your life, for the life you live, your responsibility. You're responsible. The Bible said, whatsoever a man soweth, at that man shall also reap. Well, that's personal, as personal as it gets. But I watch for your souls. That's my responsibility. So the, you, it wouldn't be hard to believe that in the hands of this one, these seven stars would represent the seven pastors of these churches. They're in his hand, in his hand. And so therefore, when you look at it from that perspective, you begin to understand how that he is guiding his church through his pastors and that that church is a light to this darkened world. And the problem is that the Lord Jesus can remove that light of that individual church. And it doesn't mean that the body of Christ goes dark, but the local church may. That's individual, as I said a moment ago. There is a church in Smyrna, but you'll find none in Ephesus. Go around to these other places. Bare fields, Laodicea, for example, had some stones piled on top of each other. And I remember, the, I remember the, how desolate it appeared. There's a town next to it, but there's no church there. And so the indication is that the Lord said that if you don't bear the truth, if you don't shine the light, uh, I'll remove you. You'll have no reason for existence. And that's why we're here. We're here to preach the truth. We're here to tell men and women about Christ, and he is the truth. And if the, if the church is not preaching Christ, they're preaching a lie. It may be a good-sounding lie. It may, it may essentially be, uh, you know, uh, uh, theologically uh, pretty close to the truth. But if you don't preach Christ, you're not preaching the truth. For he is the absolute perfection of all doctrine. He's the end of the law for righteousness' sake. There is nothing higher than him. There's nowhere to go past him. The Lord Jesus Christ is the consummation. He finishes, he perfects everything that God ever demanded or ever gave to men. He finished it with the Lord Jesus. When he said it is finished, he meant it was finished. And the divine of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Godhood of the Lord Jesus Christ that came from glory, went back into the hands of the Father. The soul of that God-man that came into being 2,000 years ago went down into the heart of the earth and that body of the God man that walked on this earth for three and a half year, 30, 33 and a half years was laid in a tomb. And this is what we're dealing with here. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. You can't kill God. It is impossible for God to die. And the Lord Jesus Christ was as much God as God the Father. For he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. No question. So what we have here then is a rebuke. And it's not because they're not preaching the truth. They're preaching the truth. They've held to the truth. And they've lifted up the truth. And they've, they've judged those who call themselves apostles and found them to be liars. And they've had patience. That's a good thing. All of these noble, noble uh, things that he addresses to the church at Ephesus, they're good things. But the one thing that he holds them accountable for, and that's quite remarkable when you look at it, because I want you to think with me tonight now. I want you to notice what he says in verse number four. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast done what? He didn't say lost. He said what? Left your first love. That means that they made a conscious decision to leave that love. Now, I've said before and say again, I can't prove it. Uh, there are certain things that I'll say that I may nece not necessarily be able to go to the Bible and prove, but there's not one word in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says an angel can love. You won't find it. You'll never find from Genesis to Revelation a passage that talks about an angel praying. 
But these are things highly spiritual that are given to us, the ability to love. In plain words, we can love him in returning to him the kind of love he gave us. Now, it doesn't get any more personal than that. There's nothing any greater than that in your life. If tonight you still believe all the fundamentals of the faith, that's good for you. But do you love him? And this is something that you don't give lip service. You don't give lip service to God. He knows the heart. He knows if you love him. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you may love him. And I can name a few of them tonight, but I'm not going to jump ahead of myself. I just want you to think it through. Do you love him? If you've ever really spent any time in observing the cross, let the Holy Spirit take you on a tour of the cross and of Gethsemane. And really look at it. I mean really look at it. Look at it not only in its physical aspect, but look at it in the sacrifice that was made. And look at how personal it becomes. The Lord Jesus Christ went to that cross freely. He said, I'll lay my life down. No man takes it from me. And the cross is one of the most horrible forms of death that you could ever imagine. Whoever cooked up the idea of a cross, it came straight out of hell. No question about it. Because the cross is not so much as an instrument of death as it is an instrument of torture. That's exactly right. They want the person to suffer as much suffering as possible. So therefore the cross becomes a place of torture. Don't you think it's remarkable that before God ever made a man that he chose that to die for that man, that he would be tortured for that man? And if that does not bring a response out of your soul tonight to love him because he did that for you, if you can take a tour of the cross and of Gethsemane where his sweat became great drops of blood and the burdens of all eternity bore down on his soul to the point that God had to send his angels, his angels to bear him up as he went through this. If you can, if you can take a tour of all of that tonight and it doesn't bring love out of your soul for him, I wonder what's in your soul. I really do. Because it's, it's one thing for you to, as the Pharisee, he had his list of what he believed. I'm sure his doctrine was pure. I'm sure he, I'm sure he, was, he, he had received all the applause that he possibly could. And I'm sure that's all well and good among men. But it's this idea that you reach up to one and say, it doesn't matter how much it hurts. It doesn't make any difference how far I've fallen. It doesn't make any difference if I've, if I've fallen in within myself, that I have no answer for what I've done, I can make no more excuses, I still love you. And there are people out there that don't go to church, but they do love him. And don't be so quick to judge him. As I was preaching to you this morning, don't be so quick. Uh, I've learned down through decades that, that uh, God is eminently greater than I am in the ability to judge. And let me tell you something, if they do love him, they will come to themselves one day. And he said, those I love, I chasten. And when you chasten a child of God, it's a personal thing. It's so personal because they know that the one that loves them, they know that love is real. They've experienced that love and they'll love him back. Love will do the job. There's nothing greater than love on this earth. If you've never been loved and never have loved, you've missed. You're a dying person. You're dead. You're dead on the inside. You're a, you're a machine. You, you're, 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 you're no greater than artificial intelligence. And let me tell you something about it. In just a few days, they're going to bring uh, Elvis Presley. And they're going to bring a hologram. A hologram is a three-dimensional uh, appearance, okay? That in itself is quite a thing. But then it rises above that. It comes to the point of artificial intelligence producing this image of Elvis Presley. Now, Elvis Presley died the year I came to Temple. I think it was 1976, somewhere in there. He was born 1935. And uh, if, you, if you weren't alive back in the time when Elvis was, they called him the king, you really don't understand. I mean, he was the voice of voices among all voices. All tried to attain to the heights of Elvis Presley. No question. Well, let me give you an idea of what it means for the artificial intelligence. Here you have a hologram of Elvis Presley, all right, and it's artificial intelligence. And you walk up to that hologram, and that hologram looks at you and addresses you by your first name and tells you where you came from and who your parents were. 
you say, preacher, now that takes intelligence. That's the point. The point is that they have risen above robots. They have risen above uh, what appears to be just limitations of humanity. And they're trying to warn people. And I, I didn't mean to get off on this, but I'm going to tell you while I'm at it. They're trying to warn people that right now it's a novelty, it's all new, and, and we are enjoying some of the things, especially in the medical, medical field, artificial intelligence. But they're warning people that this thing is so smart. When I say thing, I'm talking about it, artificial intelligence, that it will reach the point when it is smarter than you. And you will no longer control it. It will control you. And it never gets tired. And they may have created a monster. And this monster you may see show up in Revelation 13. Where he said he had power to give life to the image of the beast. That it should speak. Call fire down from heaven. Folks, wake up. You're living in a generation where things are happening at warp speed. Exponentially. Yes, they are. What used to take 10 years now sometimes takes 10 days. We're at that point. So what does that do? Does it scare you, preacher? No, it fires me up. Lord's coming back. Amen. Hallelujah to God. How do you know? Daniel said knowledge shall increase. And that knowledge increasing is not so much going from a steam engine to a four-wheel car. It's the knowledge that we have right at our disposals today. You have more power in that cell phone you've got in your pocket than that first computer that's cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. You're carrying it around right now in your pocket. That's how far they've come. So the angels in the Bible, the very, very profound thing, for it says the angel, this is the angel of the church of Ephesus, or the angel of the church of Laodicea, or the th angel of the church of Thyatira, or the angel of the church of Smyrna, and on he goes when he names the seven of them. The angel in the Bible can be a manifestation of God himself in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. An angel in the Bible can be as it was when Rhoda went to the door and Peter was in jail, and he, she said, Peter's out here. And they said, it's his angel. What did they mean? His guardian angel? Why would he come and announce anything? What they were saying was, it may be a, a manifestation of him, a spirit appearance of him. You don't believe in spirits? Then you don't believe in the Bible. Amen. You better believe it. You don't, and they're everywhere today. So an angel is a manifestation, but an angel can be a created thing. It can be a thing like an angel, Gabriel and Michael and so forth. It, that's its being. It's made as an angel. And uh, that, that, most of the time in the Bible, that's what it's referring to. But don't ever limit yourself when it talks about an angel to simply mean something with wings that flies around and it's a being, an angelic being. Uh, there's far more in the Bible than that. So what we have in Revelation to open up for us here tonight is the simple fact that maybe I and maybe every other minister that is pastoring an assembly of believers has a representation in the presence of Almighty God. You remember what he said about the children? What did he say about the little children? He said, their angel doth behold the face of my father. Did he not? What's he mean by that? Somebody said, well, that's their guardian angel. Well, you can't be sure of that. It may very well be. And remember this. Remember this. When you get into the spirit world, spirit world, all right? Forget all the laws of physics. Forget all the laws that, that bind creatures, you know, in time and space. Forget it. When Satan showed the Lord Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, what did he do? He showed him the kingdoms of the world, past, present, future, just like Revelation, in a moment of time. He said, this has been given to me. I can give it to whomsoever I will. And he is today, because that's who we wrestle against. So what is the essence of a spirit? Nobody knows. Don't ever let them tell you they know because they don't know. We know typology, when, so forth and so on. Since we do not know the essence of a spirit, there is no way in this world that you can know where a spirit can be, when a spirit can be, how a spirit can be, what can happen when a spirit shows up or disappears or things of that nature. And I'm not trying to scare you tonight. 
But I'm trying to tell you that out here in this world, when they're ghost chasers and they're big thing on TV all the time about uh, they use this high-tech equipment to measure whether a ghost has been there or not and all this stuff, and people get all carried away with it. Well, let me tell you something. If you're born again, you have the Holy Ghost dwelling in you. Amen. And I've noticed new theology, they don't like that word ghost, so they call it Holy Spirit. They say, well, you're going back into, you know, you're going back into ancient English and you're going back in, into a time where, where they were superstitious, you know, and the ghost, ghost is not a good translation. No, it's not. It's not. That's a separate study in itself, but make no mistake about it. The New Testament uses both terms interchangeably. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Now, there is an unholy ghost. If there's a Holy Ghost, there's an unholy ghost. In plain words, there are spirits out there you don't want to mess with. And the New Testament says much about them. So what you have here in Revelation chapter number 2, the church at Ephesus, and he rebukes them over something that, that a lot of people would think, well, what big deal? Well, it's this big deal. If it is true, and I say again, that only a man can love God, then what the Lord is rebuking them for is he's saying, I have given you something. You have access to me. I have a place in your heart and in your life that nothing else can. An angel cannot take that place. Nothing but a man. And I'm waiting for you to come into that chamber. I want to talk to you. I want to love you. And I want you to love me. But you have to make that choice to love him. So you can be doctrinally right down the line. You can be straight as an arrow, gun barrel straight. I mean, you can cross all the T's and dot all the I's and be dead as a door. Yes, you can. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost will not bless a bunch of self-righteous, self-absorbed people. Because once you lose that love for Christ, once, you're not, don't, once you don't love our Lord Jesus Christ, my dear friend, then what you're getting from today is more than likely you're going to fall in love with yourself again. And it's going to be all about you and how you can perform to each other. And I'm telling you, you can go to some churches. I mean, they've got some good performances. Good night, man. You can, I'm telling you right now. They, they, can, uh, they can challenge Hollywood in the performances that they put on. Oh, yeah. But there's no power. There's no power. And I'm not the power. The power is the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost power. <laughs> and we have to have that. And here's what he said to them. He says, I'll remove that. I'll take my light. I'll take the light and I'll take it away. So in the Old Testament, have you ever heard of a man named Ichabod? I know you've heard, what's his name? Irving wrote the, 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 the poem, Ichabod Crane. Do you know what the word Ichabod means? It means the glory hath departed. It's gone. People are still there. They have their plaque on the wall that says, we believe these things. Baptists believe these things. What they call that? I, we've never had one. Uh, I've preached a bunch of revivals in churches that have them. What's it, what's it called? Church covenant? Something like that. Yeah. And they list the things that we believe. And I look at them and I agree. Amen. I've, I've read them many times. And I, I believe, agree everything they said. No problem. But they're dead. So believing all of that didn't give them life, did it? No. What gives them life? A real heart of love for our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. You see, because you're capable of it, and not only that, the fact whether you have it or don't have it judges the kind of life you live and what's important to you. For where your treasure is, there will be your what? Exactly. How many of you tonight would sell the Lord for a million dollars? Put him on the auction block, sell him for a million bucks. I had a million dollars. If I had a million dollars, sell the Lord. I, could, I mean, I could have myself a time, right? Well, I could, get, I, could, I could get falling down drunk for six months. I haven't been drunk since 1973. Budweiser went out. If they, if they were, if, if I kept them up, they'd, you know, they'd be, but that's nothing great about me. I just quit it when I got saved. Quit it. I quit it. I did. Did my share. Oh, yeah. I'm not up here to brag on the devil. But God, God gave me grace. Amen. He did. He did. I wouldn't sell him for a million dollars. I wouldn't sell him for anything. I'm not going to sell him. I couldn't live without him. How important is the Lord Jesus to you? Does it really matter to you? 
Peter, after his resurrection, lovest thou me more than these? He didn't say, Peter, do you believe such and such and such and such? No. He said, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Why did he challenge his love? Because that's what Peter would have to have to go on into the future. And that's what we'll have to have to go on into the future. Did you know the apostle says this? I find this a remarkable thing. It's quite a thing to look at too. Here's what he says. Colossians 2.2. 2, we are knit together in love. Now how many of you ladies have ever done any knitting? Where you, My mother-in-law used to make, make uh, uh, blankets and she'd sew pieces together. And you can go out to the stores today and these blankets are very expensive because it's handmade and they've sewed the squares together. And she would sit for hour on hour on hour and she was making these blankets. She was knitting them together, joining the pieces together. That took patience. She took love too because she'd give them away. We've got, we've got, wouldn't take anything for it. It's made by my mother-in-law whom I love very dearly. This is what he says we're supposed to be, knit together in love. Now, if you're full of yourself and you love yourself, forget it, you'll never be knit together. You'll always perform for each other. You'll always try to impress each other. And, uh, and, you, and, 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 and what you'll have is church love. And boy, God, give me something better than church love. Give me real love. Amen. If you really love somebody, I'm going to tell you now, I shouldn't have to tell you, but if you really love somebody and somebody comes after that one you love, they better watch out. That's all I can say. They better watch out. Amen. They better watch out. Well, he said to turn the other cheek. He did. But he also said after that to buy a sword. Yes, he did. Remember what I said the other night? Before you jump up and start preaching something as absolute doctrine, make sure you know everything the Bible has to say about what you're talking about. Everything in context, past, present, future, in context. Not only that, but always keep in mind, the Bible might not have said everything there could be said about what you're dealing with, right? So somebody comes into your house and he's going to kill your family. Well, I pull my sword. It, ha it may be Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson. It may be Sam Colt. It may be Sturm Ruger. It, you know, but you pull your sword. That's what you do. You protect your family. That's what you do. Yes, yes. That's uh, what you ought to. I'll tell you what you ought to do. <laughs> you ought to do a little reading on the side and read how Christians in countries like Pakistan and Egypt and places like that where they're being persecuted. And they come into their buildings and they drag them out into the street and they rape their women right in front of them. And watch how they have to deal with stuff like that. And a lot of these churches can only take so much. And after they've had enough of it, then they say, enough. You're not going to drag our women out into the street. It's not going to happen anymore. And you know what happens? They quit dragging their women out into the street and rape them in front, in front of their children and husbands. You know why? Because of the devil's message over there in Job chapter number one. You know what the devil said? It's scripture. Skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin. Did you know that? Now, that's what Satan said. Now, you got to remember this. Satan said it. God didn't say it. But the truth of the matter is it's about 99% right for most people. All they care about is their skin. Right? Themselves. Their self-love. But not everyone, because Job proved himself to be higher than that. See, you touch his skin and he'll do anything. Their God is their belly, it says. So the church at Ephesus was commended for all the right things they did. Do you know a little bit about Ephesus? The book of Ephesians is a doctrinal book. It raises you way up in the air. It talks about election. It talks about dispensations. It talks about the power of the resurrected Christ. It talks about the purpose of God through ages and ages to come. It talks about twain becoming one new man. In other words, Jew and Gentile. In the body of Christ, there is no difference. A lot of the Jews don't like that, but that is a fact. 
Once you become a member of the body of Christ, there are no... Now, you can still retain your Jewish identity, and I'm a Jew, but you know, and so forth and so on. But in Christ, you have no higher level. There is no difference. In him, you are a born-again believer, whether Jew or Gentile. Structure the church, he gives you. Structure the church in the book of Ephesians. It's a remarkable thing. He talks about the bishops and the elders. He talks about the deacons. He talks about, he talks about the people, the teachers, the apostles, foundation of the church, and all of that. It's all a good thing. Then he talks about the fact that he himself descended into Hades. All right? So what is Hades? The Greek word it means the heart of the earth. It can be translated hell and usually is. A lot of times scholars like to use the word Hades on you to simply make you think they know something you don't know, so they're going to twist you. It's, that's not a big deal, folks. Hades in the New Testament is the equivalent of Sheol in the Old Testament. What is it? It's in the heart of the earth. It is the unseen state of the dead. The reason I use that word is because I do not believe for one minute that the Lord Jesus Christ went into hell fire when he descended into the heart of the earth. What for? Hell fire does not pay for your sins. It was the blood of Christ on the cross that pays for your sins. Amen. But you got him out there teaching that he went over into hell and burned and there suffered and that was part of the atonement. That's garbage. There's not a word in the New Testament that bears that up. But uh, the reason I mention that is I want you to know that there is an issue with that. I went to Ephesus. It's one of the most remarkable places I've ever seen. It really is. I'll never forget Ephesus. It lies, as the archaeologist would say, in situ. In other words, it's exactly the way it was 2,000 years ago. You can walk down the main street of Ephesus at the bottom of the hill. I can see it in my eye just like I was there. At the bottom of the hill stands this beautiful colonnaded building, and they said it was the library. I thought to myself, good night, and it's a huge library. And a library 2,000 years ago would be holding all these books which would be containing the wisdom of man at that time. Now think about the library at Alexandria, Egypt. Remember that one? It was burned. And I don't know how they lament the fact that that library was burned in Alexandria, Egypt. But here in Ephesus, there the building stands. Of course, there's no books in it, but the building is there. And if you go to the right and walk just a little ways, just not too far, you'll find an amphitheater. It's standing just, were you there, brother? You, you didn't go there? You'll find an amphitheater. What that is, is the, the Greeks were big on it, the, Jew, the Romans were big on it. It's kind of like a, it's just a, like a, the Hollywood Bowl. How many have ever seen that? The Hollywood Bowl. I mean, that was a long time ago we're going back. But it's a thing that's a half circle, and it's got all of these seats, and you can go plumb to the top, and then down at the bottom, you've got the place for performance. And it's just like it was 2,000 years ago. So that's back when I was young, and I uh, had a couple of guys with me, and I said, y'all want to go to the top? Yes, sir, buddy. And so up we went. We climbed right up to the top, got up there, looked down on this thing. We looked over at each other and said, this is where for two solid hours they screamed, great is Diana of the Ephesians. It's there just exactly like it was 2,000 years ago. But I also saw this at Ephesus. I saw one of the most grotesque, I mean grotesque, sexual uh, orient uh, uh, depiction, that'd be a good way to put it, that I'd ever seen in my life, and it's 2,000 years old. You see, Diana is Artemis, and she was a fertility goddess, and so they worship the act of fertility in itself, or procreation, or what brings that about, and it, it, got, it got very deeply into the sexual aspect of it, and so there at Ephesus, they were literally consumed, they were consumed with sexuality. It was all about that. Anytime that starts, it brings out the demons. Just like America is consumed today. It is absolutely consumed with sexuality. It's to the point now when you go on the average pulpit in the country, you know, all you hear is a message about sex, this or that, or so forth and so on. And of course, this is Satan, and he's, what he's trying to do is to destroy the image of God in man, God's image, and by the way, nowhere in the Bible does it say an angel, is in the image of God, only the man. And this image of God is what Satan went after to destroy, and this is exactly what he's going to do with the mark of the beast, and that's coming, it's coming, it's, it's coming, it's right around the corner. And one of the avenues he uses to get them there is sex. They get addicted to it. 
and every kind of perversion that you can imagine. Have you ever noticed all of these drag queens now? They want to get into the public school system around your little children. Notice? It's not enough for some man to wake up in the morning as a man and at noon he's a woman and he goes into the women's bathroom or he's, he's a man and he, and, he, and he begins to compete athletically with women and so therefore he can go into their dressing room and the women of course are embarrassed to death. Here stands this male with all his male genitalia and there he stands before them and, he's, and, and you know what's he doing? What's he doing? Why he's, he, what's, it, what's the word for it when you just broadcast yourself out? voyeurism or something I can't remember the word but they, this, is what the, this is what he lives for this is what he's in there for it's not because he wants to be a female it's because he wants to feed that sexual perversion that ego that part within him that's what he's doing and the government's supporting him yay yeah they are yeah they are folks God made man he made woman male and female created he them one man one woman he brought the man and woman together to procreate and bring children into this world. There is nothing on the face of this earth that's any more blessed of God as for a man and a woman to have a child and have a home and have God's hand upon it. God blesses them and that's the way it ought to be. Amen. Therefore the children will grow up and their minds will form and they will mature uh, the way they should mature. They'll understand the, the issues of life in the way they should understand them. And that's what, that's, 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 that's what God intended for it to be. But Satan, one of his greatest weapons is to work through sexuality. This is what happened here. So therefore the church at Ephesus lost its light. There's no light in Ephesus. You go over there now, no light. So what will keep Temple Baptist Church alive tonight? What will keep the light here tonight? All right? I don't think that we'd, we'd have any problem with, with a bunch of people getting together and saying, Oh, I don't believe in the virgin birth anymore. I don't believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. I just, no, I don't believe in hell. You know, no, I, I just don't believe it anymore. Okay? Well, you, let me tell you something. That's not the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he's the rock. And it's our love for him that will keep us together and keep the light on here at Temple. So we need to find whatever it is that we need to find that's separating us from the love of Christ. If you are, if you don't love him tonight, there's no more I can really say to you, nothing I can do to help. If you don't love him, but you've been born again, uh, ask him to renew the fire in your soul. Maybe you need to put your hand to the plow again. Maybe you need to realize why we're here. These people are lost out here, folks. They're in darkness. They're killing each other. They're raping each other. They are in every sense of the word. They hate each other. Yeah, they do. There's no great, there's no great uh, movement out there to tear the church apart among these people. They don't care. They couldn't care less. You have some organizations and some stuff out there that would like to shut us up. But that's only a minority of what's going on out here. These are just organizations. But as far as the average man on the street, he couldn't care less. Whether you live or die, whether this place is open or not, he doesn't care about that. That doesn't mean anything to him. But I love Temple Baptist Church, and I love him. And as long as there's breath in this body, I want the light to shine in this place. I do. As long as, oh, God help me to think that I could just walk off and let Temple Baptist Church dry up and die, and the light flicker out and go out. And then one day they drive by and say, you know, there used to be a church down there. Well, they've got buildings. They're using them for a warehouse. We could probably stock a lot of water in here. <laughs> you know, pretty good sized building. You could use it for a warehouse. No, it's going to be the church of God till he comes to get us. And what will keep us together is the church of God is our love for him and love for each other. And it'll knit us together where we can't be ripped apart. And if you love each other the way you ought to love each other, First, you have to love Christ, though. You've got to have your love for Christ right. If you give your love for Christ right, the love for each other will come. It'll come. It'll come. It'll come. And that's where he said, shall, by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you can quote the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are good. Nothing wrong with Ten Commandments. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have a wonderful choir and sing beautiful music. And you have 
You have a consciousness for the community and so forth and so on. No, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have what? Love one for another. And I'm going to tell you something. There are some people hard to love. I mean, live long enough to understand that. I mean, hard to love. Hard to love. <laughs> That's a test of your spirituality and how great you are. Do you love the unlovable? Ask God to give you the love in your heart that you need for each other, for the ministry, for the pastor, for the elders in the church, for the deacons in the church, and for all those Sunday school teachers and Wednesday night teachers, and a love for the work of God and for the ministry. Ask God to give you that love tonight. Ask him to give it to you if you don't have it. Because I'm going to tell you something. There's no doubt in my mind. I'll close with this. I love him. I love him. I love him. I do. I love him. It doesn't make any difference what men do to me. They may lock me up somewhere, but I still love him. I love him. May they can, they can come and take every dime I've got away, but they can't take him away. I love him. I love him. Do you love him? There's every reason you should. Do you love him? Father, bless your word, time we've had together. Use it for the glory of God. Lord, you rebuked the church at Ephesus and you told them to repent. That's strong talk because they didn't love you. They left their first love. Oh, God, tonight, may we know that that's important to you. And you know if we love you. We, you know it. I pray that that would be settled in the hearts of the people in this house, that we love you and we love you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we'll stand up and sing here tonight. What have we got, brother?